Good morning. For the past five Sundays, we've been focusing our worship on the voices of the prophets, both old and new. And that's a good thing to do, because where would we, a Christian faith community, be without them? Without prophets, there's no personal or social transformation. There's no champions of compassion, love, and justice. And God is rendered mute. God does nothing without telling the prophets about it, says the book of Amos. They are like God's press secretaries. But from the prophet's perspective, their calling comes with a lot of vocational hazards. Often we ignore and marginalize them. We break their hearts. Periodically, we kill them. God said to the prophet Ezekiel, I am sending you to a defiant and stubborn people. I suspect Ezekiel muttered in response, is there any other kind? Yet the church is one place that aspires to hear the prophets, and once it has heard, to respond. That is our vocation. It's our mission. It's our raison d'etre. We exist to give witness to the God of the prophets and their unorthodox, decidedly countercultural kingdom of love compassion, repentance, salvation, and repair. Everything else, everything else is secondary. So what are God's prophets saying to us? And by us, I am referring to a largely white church comfortably situated in a land that lays claim to one of the longest standing white supremacist social orders in the history of the world. Before answering that, I want to respond to those raised eyebrows that uh, some of you just gave me. Yes, I can see through Zoom. I want to acknowledge that my use of the term white supremacy may be jarring to some, sound like hyperbole. It's a phrase white people usually associate with the KKK, not the USA, and therefore it can add to white people's dis-ease and shame and defensiveness with the subject of racism feelings I and nearly all white people I know struggle with. But I think it is an appropriate term that's both historically accurate and a better description of a social, cultural, and political order that disproportionately and deliberate, deliberately benefits those deemed to be white. And to grapple with our white supremacist context starts with seeing it for what it is and to contend with its most enduring effect Indeed, its very essence, which is theft. Massive, multi-generational, and murderous theft. This includes the theft of power, the theft of agency, of wealth, of land, of hope, and of the very truth about black lives. So what do the prophets say? Or more to the point, what have the prophets been saying for hundreds and hundreds of years to us? I want to suggest this morning that the prophetic cry to the white church in the United States, which I've been hearing more and more consistently, can be, can be summarized in one word, reparations. And the more I've opened myself to the many voices offering this word, the more excited I get about the possibility of our assembly community participating in what God's spirit is up to in a climate where it often feels like the only response we can muster to the vast legacy of white supremacy is lament. There are proactive, redemptive, and prophetic steps forward. Now, the best way I know how to talk about reparations, about what it means, is by talking about the biblical response to theft. And I'm taking my cues in large part from Duke Kwan and Gregory Thompson's helpful book, Reparations, A Christian Call for Repentance and Repair, which focuses on anti-black racism, as am I this morning. They describe white supremacy in America, which includes everything from slavery, denial of education, mass incarceration, redlining, Jim Crow, police killings, etc., etc., as a type of theft. And it is a theft with which the white church in America has, to put it mildly, a complicated history. Now, there is a history 
of faithful re Christian resistance to white supremacy. For example, as early as 1663, anti-slavery Mennonites banned slavery in their settlement on the Delaware Bay. Quakers led abolition efforts. But the larger story of the white church is one of shameful failure. The church has been a perpetrator, accomplice, and silent bystander in relation to this theft. And Mennonites were no exception. So what is the proper response to theft? Well, the Gospel of Luke provides us with two stories that are particularly instructive. That of the tax collector Zacchaeus and the story of the Good Samaritan. Each, of course, deserves their own sermon, but this morning I will give only brief comments. Zacchaeus was a, was a theft in plain sight. All tax collectors of that time were. That's how the system worked. But when Jesus came to town and saw Zacchaeus up in a tree, two very surprising things happened. One, Jesus offers unmerited and radical kindness to Zacchaeus, to the very instigator and beneficiary of theft. And two, Zacchaeus has a radical transformation. Friends, there is your snapshot of the kingdom of God. Divine love sees us, calls us by name, and regardless of how notorious our past, offers us a chance to change our story. In other words, to repent, not as guilt-laden miscreants, but as new creations in the book of love. And once born anew in this way, old ways of seeing, of thinking, and of living will no longer do. This includes thinking that mere repentance for past thievery by itself is sufficient. If I steal your car and later tell you I'm sorry, but continue to drive your car, you likely will not be impressed with my change of heart. Repentance requires restitution, the act of making things right. That is why restitution is not an act of charity, Rather, it is the discharge of a debt. No character in the Bible better illustrates this point than Zacchaeus. He, his encounter with divine love leads him to acknowledge his role in the center of a system designed to plunder the most vulnerable members of society. And he responds with uncommon generosity. I'll give half of my possessions to the poor, he declares. And if I've defrauded anyone, I'll pay it back fourfold. With this commitment, Jesus announces that salvation has come to the house of Zacchaeus. Through this story, we see how an account encounter with divine love and a willingness to see one's culpability, one's participation in and benefit from theft, lead to repairing what was broken and sparing no expense to restore to our neighbors all that was taken. That, friends, is what theft requires, the biblical ethic of restitution. But reparations is not based solely on this ethic of restitution, but also on the ethic of restoration. Yes, I know, so many big R words, sorry about that. So let us now turn to the story of the Good Samaritan. Restoration, put simply, is the basic Christian call to love one's neighbor. And you may remember that love of neighbor is the central concern of the Good Samaritan story. That story in Luke 10 starts with a self-justifying lawyer saying to Jesus, I know that to inherit eternal life, I must love my neighbor as myself, but tell me, who really is my neighbor? Mr. Rogers, I mean, Jesus responds with a story of a violent and bloody crime. A man on the road has been attacked, stripped, beaten until half dead and robbed. The assault, like the legacy of white supremacy, was extensive and brutal. 
The first two who came across, across this crime scene are a priest and a Levite, both respectable churchgoers. They see the beaten man, but they don't see him in the same way as does the third traveler, the Samaritan. What's the difference? The text tells us that upon seeing, only the Samaritan was filled with compassion. Compassion is a visceral word. It means to be moved in one's bowels, the bowels being thought of in the ancient world as the seat of love. Compassion is what Luke tells us in chapter 6 is the leading characteristic of God. It's the love that enters into the suffering of others, a kind of love that separates true Christian witness from whatever poses as Christian faith these days. It is also an act of resistance in a social order that can only be described as anti-neighbor. Its impulse is not merely for a check to be written or a debt to be repaid, but for a world to be repaired. And unlike restitution, which we associated with Zacchaeus, which calls the white church to reckon with its culpability in the sin of white supremacy, the ethic of restoration calls us to reckon with our essential calling as Christians in the world, whether culpable or not. In this story, the Samaritan was not responding to his part in the crime. He had none. Rather, he was modeling and imitating the love of God, a love that goes to great lengths to restore the suffering, the lost, the oppressed, the beaten down. Still, the story is a disquieting one. Because of how the priest and the Levite dramatically portray our avoidance and reluctance to offer restorative love. This is particularly true for those of us who carry white privilege. I'm reminded of the words of Ida B. Wells, the prominent journalist and anti-lynching activist who once described African Americans as being accustomed to the indifference and apathy of white Christian people. All too often, we have chosen to pass by on the other side. But the struggle to love is also a human one. Fear, hostility, tribalism, moral blindness, these all contribute to this. So it's not hard to imagine that when the priest and the Levite see the half-dead man, they ask themselves, what will happen to me if I stop to help? Yet it seems the Samaritan was able to reverse the question and ask, if I do not stop, what will happen to him? That's the kind of love that sums up the entire gospel and which lies behind the ethic of restoration. So there you have it. My primary goal this morning has been to share a prophetic biblical call for reparations, a call that consists of restitution and restoration. But of course, scripture is not our only source for a prophetic word. Other prophets grounded in faith and grounded in justice have been speaking to us. I hear Fannie Lou Hamer declaring that we wouldn't have a race, racial crisis in America if the church had not consistently failed to deal with racism as the severe sin it is. I hear the Reverend Francis Grimke, a leading African-American minister in the early 20th century, calling out the church's easy coexistence with racism and exclaiming that the first thing for the church to do is to wake up to the fact that it can do something. And I hear James Foreman, in 1969, dramatically interrupting the worship service in the historic Riverside Church to read a statement known as the Black Manifesto, declaring that white churches owed reparations for their centuries of racist complicity, and that reparations would be the true test of white Christians' faith and belief in the cross and the words of the prophets. And I hear Justin Merrick, community leader in Memphis, Tennessee, observing that reparations are ultimately redeeming to everyone, both those who give and those who receive. It is an opportunity for all of us, he says, 
to finally be healed. And closer to home, we have the voice of those who in 1974 crafted what is known as the Assembly 2% Fund. They were compelled by the urgent fact that they lived in a nation made wealthy by the exploitation of others, and therefore were called to pay restitution to those who have been exploited. That fund may very, <clears throat> may very well be our vehicle for reparations. In the coming months, I'm hopeful that the Assembly's Reparations Task Force, which has met a handful of times since October, will share with the congregation a proposal for how we might shift the 2% fund to focus specifically on reparations, given the urgency of the facts before us. But I'm not Pollyanna-ish that anything we can do at assembly will fix the historic brokenness we live in. And I certainly don't want to go off on some flight of misguided white saviorism, nor succumb to the fear present in white progressive communities of being paternalistic, which leads to a form of disengagement. Rather, what draws me to the reparation movement is not that it is a call to pay, but that it, it is a call to own, to own our responsibility. And even more importantly, to own our identity as God's people, a people who renounce white supremacy and who address the immeasurable harm it has wrought so that we can become the community God created us to be, a community of repair. May it be so. Amen.